I would invite you to join with me in an opening prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for calling us here this day to celebrate and honor the spring 2014 graduates from the College of Law. We pray your presence be with those who receive their hoods and are awarded their degrees this day. May our time together be directed by your hand, filled with joyful smiles and warm hearts, touched by solemn ritual. Today is truly a day of thanksgiving, gracious God, for your guidance in bringing us to this place at this hour for this joyous occasion. To you, holy God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. And it is an honor to introduce to you the dean of the law school. She holds the uh, chair, the Dean John Rogers Endowed Chair. The uh, endowed chair is named after my wife's great uncle, John Rogers. And it is with that privilege that I am able to introduce you today to Dean Janet Levitt. President Upham, faculty, students, family, friends, and alumni, welcome to the College of Law's 89th Annual Hooding Ceremony. This morning, at the university's commencement exercises, several members of the College of Law community received special recognition. First, the College of Law's Public Interest Law Board, several of the graduates are members of that organization, won the prestigious Medicine Wheel Award. And additionally, a current student, Calvin Moniz, won, also won the Medicine Wheel Award. Professor Evelyn Hutchison won the university's Outstanding Teacher Award. An alumnus, Frank Cooper, was recognized as one of three outstanding high school teachers. And our speaker today, the Honorable Lane R. Phillips, received an honorary Doctor of Human Letters degree at this morning's commencement exercises. Let's give all of them a hand. Also at this morning's ceremony, President Upham conferred your degrees, and I accepted them on your behalf. So graduates, all of us at the College of Law offer our sincerest congratulations on your tremendous achievement. And to the family and friends who join us today, welcome to the University of Tulsa and to the University of Tulsa College of Law. We thank you for all of your support. Our graduates' accomplishments would simply not have been possible without you. So graduates, I ask you to stand, turn around, try to find your family or friends, and let's give them a round of applause. OK, you can turn around now. Close to, close to me? OK. Okay. Over the past three years, the world has changed in big ways and small. Most troops have returned from Iraq and Afghanistan, and the world's attention instead has turned to places like Syria and the Ukraine. The stock market closed at 10,900 the day that you entered law school. And yesterday, it closed just a bit over 16,500. And since the three years that you've been in law school, the Supreme Court has opined on issues of same-sex marriage, affirmative action, and the constitutionality of comprehensive health care reform. Now, on a more mundane level, much has changed as, e as well. Email has gone the way of snail mail replaced with Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat. DVRs have made binging on series like House of Cards or Breaking Bad a weekend pastime. And I checked, LOL is now officially listed in the Webster's Dictionary. One event of the past three years that stands out for me 
is the passing of a true giant, Nelson Mandela. With his death, I have reflected deeply on the role of law, lawyers, and leaders in ordering a just society. And while I could speak at great length about the lessons and legacy of Mandela's life, I would like to leave you with just one thought. In Mandela's memoirs, he wrote extensively about the student-led divestment movement in the United States as an extremely significant, if not critical, event in the toppling of apartheid. When I was in college and law school, I remember vividly walking along the main university green past student-built shanty structures that housed peaceful sit-ins protesting apartheid in South Africa. Now, what could college students in the US possibly do about a long-standing apartheid system halfway around the world? They were asking university leadership to divest endowment dollars, endowment that accounted for billions and billions of dollars. And they were asking them to divest this from any company or government doing business in apartheid South Africa. Ultimately, over 100 universities divested, as did pension funds from several states and local governments. And in response to this movement, the US Congress imposed sanctions on South Africa, ultimately resulting in more than 20 billion in lost business and an effective economic collapse of the South African apartheid regime. So while charismatic leadership certainly played an important role in apartheid's demise, it was the bottom-up efforts of small groups of college students, students who were no different from all of you, that had a catalytic, catalytic impact. So I ask you today, find your Mandela moment. Take a stand on an issue that ignites your passions, whether it's racial equality or religious liberty or deficit reduction or income inequality. Act on your convictions. Take a stand. This is often not comfortable to do. It requires venturing from our complacency and standing ready to confront opposition and naysayers. Let, yet law school has trained you to do just this and to do it quite well. Stand tall and step out there. If it was college students from halfway around the world who hastened the downfall of the highly entrenched apartheid regime, then you too can spark the change that will leave our society all the stronger and all the better. Congratulations, graduates. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, an accomplished TU alumnus who has done well for himself, for his profession, and for the system of justice upon which many of us enter today and upon which all of us rely. Judge Lane Phillips began his University of Tulsa career as an economics major and a star member of the tennis team. In 1974, his senior year, the Wall Street Journal named him Outstanding Economics Graduate and he won the Missouri Valley Tennis Championship at number one singles. He continued to distinguish himself as a student at TU Law, serving as managing editor of the Tulsa Law Review and winning the B Robert Butler Award for Legal Writing. After completing his law degree, Judge Phillips pursued additional study at Georgetown University Law Center in the field of antitrust and economic regulation of industry. In 1980, he joined the U.S. Attorney's Office in Los Angeles and served as a federal prosecutor in the Central District of California. In late 1983, he returned to Oklahoma to serve as a United States Attorney under nomination from President Ronald Reagan, and at age 34, President Reagan nominated him to serve as United States District Judge for the Western District of Oklahoma. And this morning, he offered all of us a real treat by actually playing a tape of President Ronald Reagan asking him um, if he would accept the nomination as a district judge. 
In 1991, Judge Phillips left the federal bench and joined the renowned Los Angeles-based firm of Irela Manella. There, he has specialized in complex civil litigation, internal investigations, and alternate dispute resolution. Last year, working primarily out of Los Angeles and New York, he finalized more than six billion in complex business settlements. Some of his more prominent mediations include the NFL concussion cases, the NCAA concussion litigation, and several prominent cases arising out of the 2008 financial crisis. Judge Phillips has been widely recognized for his work. He is a fellow in the American College of Trial Lawyers, an organization to recruit its members from the top 1% of trial lawyers in America. In 1989, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce named Judge Phillips one of the 10 outstanding young Americans. Law Dragon Magazine named him one of the leading judges in America and one of the leading litigation attorneys in America. These are just a few of his many accolades, but here at TU, Judge Phillips has the unique distinction of being a member of the TU Athletic Hall of Fame, the College of Laws Hall of Fame, and a TU Distinguished Alumnus. We are very pleased that Judge Phillips is joined this weekend by his wife, Catherine, who's right there, who is also uh, a TU Law graduate and a member of the class of 1986. Judge Phillips has three accomplished children, including one who plays a leading role in the television show, The Good Wife. Judge Phillips delivered this morning's commencement speech, and if the speech this afternoon is anything like the speech this morning, we are in for a real treat. It is my honor to welcome a dear friend of the university and a dear friend of the College of Law, the Honorable Lane Phillips. Thank you, Dean Levitt. During my tenure on the bench, I always came to appreciate brevity in the remarks of counsel who appeared before me. So I'm going to be relatively brief today. It's a pleasure to be back here. Good afternoon and congratulations. Almost 35 years ago, I sat where you sat today. I'm sure I was less prepared than you are to venture out into what was then and what is now a difficult and perplexing job market. And make no mistake about it, these are difficult times. As Conan O'Brien said in his Dartmouth commencement address, it's tough out there, so be patient. The only people hiring right now are Panera Bread and the Mexican drug cartels. <laughs> Seriously, you have all been lucky enough to receive a great legal education here at TU. And while TU does an outstanding job of preparing you to think like a lawyer, there are many lessons that can only come from experience, from the actual practice of law. My purpose here today is to share with you three short lessons that I've learned with the passage of time that have made me a better lawyer. These are not things that I necessarily understood as well as I should have when I began my career. I wish I had. So I want to share with you some thoughts and stories about three topics, limits, listening, and compromise. Lesson number one deals with limits. When I became a U.S. District Judge in Oklahoma in 1987, I was assigned the former courtroom of Judge Alfred P. Murrah. Judge Murrah's name, of course, will go down in history, forever linked with the infamous 1995 bombing of the Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City. But the backstory on Judge Murrah is far more inspiring. It's the story of a 12-year-old orphan boy who hopped a freight train in Alabama and headed west. He was discovered as a stowaway and kicked off the train in Oklahoma. A caring couple in Tuttle, Oklahoma, took him in, describing him as lonely, friendless, and miserable. His dream to one day become a lawyer had very little prospect. He enrolled in high school, and four years later, he graduated as the valedictorian. He then worked his way through the University of Oklahoma and the OU College of Law. In the early 1930s, he was nominated by President Franklin Delano Roosevelt to be a U.S. District Judge in Oklahoma City and later became the Chief Judge of the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals. So from a boxcar to the federal bench, that boy's dream came true. Like you, the graduates today, Judge Murrah was fueled by a keen intellect, a can-do attitude, and plenty of street smarts. 
he saw beyond the boundaries of his background, reached for his dreams, and accomplished them. So don't let anyone tell you that you're limited in where you can go, what you can accomplish, or that where you come from has placed any kind of limits on you. Now, I wasn't an orphan, and I didn't hop a rail car. But I had my own version of taking chances and not being held to limits that were set by others or by my circumstances. <clears throat> my own story is far less compelling than that of Judge Murrah's, but the principle's the same. Indeed, I waited years into my legal career before taking a big chance. When I graduated from law school, I had a fairly limited view of what I might do and what my future might be. As a law school graduate with an economics degree, I thought I would continue my education at Georgetown Law Center in the field of economic regulation of industry, and then practice in the arena of antitrust law. That may sound like a plan, but to most of my friends it sounded pretty boring. As my friends in LA would say, it was a snooze fest. Well, it turned out that I met a young lawyer who'd also grown up in Oklahoma, who ran the organized crime drug task force in Los Angeles. And the next thing I knew, instead of handling mind-numbingly boring merger and monopolization cases in Washington, D.C., I found myself in Los Angeles courtrooms chasing the Mexican mafia, the Cali cartel, China white heroin organizations, and various cocaine cowboys. These cases were anything but boring. In November 1983, I was a young assistant U.S. attorney in Los Angeles. I was one of 250. For those of you who've seen the movie, The People vs. Larry Flint, I was one of the young prosecutors whom Larry Flint flung part of his American flag diaper across the courtroom as he was cursing out the judge and paying his fine and quarters. They had a much um, more attractive Hollywood actor playing my role in the movie. It was shortly after that event in November 1983 I heard that the U.S. Attorney in Oklahoma had announced his resignation to run for Congress. I was 31 years old. I'd never given $10 to any political party in my life. But I was nevertheless going to be home for the holidays in Tulsa, so I said, what about taking a chance, applying for the job? Uh, be my guest, my then boss said, knowing, assuming, that I wouldn't get it. But I decided to apply for the job anyway, and I interviewed with it with the swagger and the confidence of knowing that I had no real shot. Now, there's a lesson in that also, by the way. To my surprise, indeed to everyone's surprise, I got the job. The takeaway is the same as with the Judge Murrah story. Don't be afraid to reach. Don't let anyone tell you that there's a ceiling on your accomplishments. More importantly, don't tell that to yourself. Lesson number two is about compromise and competition. I used to live in the world of competition and trials, highly adversarial competition and opponent-centered trials. Now I work in the crucible of compromise, hammering out resolutions in complex arbitrations and mediations, both nationally and internationally. These are quite different but overlapping worlds. As a college athlete and a young trial lawyer, I lived by one of my personal heroes, Winston Churchill's best-known quotes. For those of you who remember it, he said, never give in, never give in, never, ever, ever, in nothing great, small, large, or petty, never give in, except to convictions of honor and good sense. People who knew me back then knew how crazily competitive I was. I was the person who defined career success by working the longest hours, going the longest without vacation, sleeping the least, winning the most, being available 24-7. Then I became a judge. That's where I learned that there was two sides to every coin, two sides to every story, that there were points of view other than my own that mattered, like the appellate court. <laughs> In short, I learned that you never declared the pancake cooked until you flipped both sides of it. I also learned that the greatest lawyers knew the difference between compromise and capitulation. As in the words of Kenny Rogers' famous song, The Gambler, the great lawyers know when to hold them, know when to fold them, know when to walk away, and when to run. Today, as I approach the sunset of my legal career, instead of living under Churchill's never give in motto, there is a plaque in my private courtroom in Los Angeles that quotes from one of Abraham Lincoln's famous speeches to the Illinois Bar Association. 
This says, lawyers should be peacemakers. Persuade your neighbor to compromise whenever you can. Point out to them that the nominal winner is often a real loser in terms of time, fees, and expenses. As a peacemaker, the lawyer has a superior opportunity of being a good person. There will still be business enough. So at first blush, there appears to be no reconciliation between the Churchillian philosophy of never giving in and the Lincoln philosophy of persuading your neighbors to compromise. Neither Churchill nor Lincoln, I might add, actually practiced everything they preached. Churchill, for example, personally negotiated 18 codicils to his so-called unconditional surrender demand to Italy. And Lincoln, after all, won the presidency because he refused to compromise on the issue of extending slavery to the then Western states. Indeed, Lincoln was immovable on his platform as to whether slavery would be permitted in the new states, and he ultimately fought a civil war rather than compromise that view. But a closer examination of these two famous quotations reveals perhaps a little more overlap than first glance would suggest. Remember that Churchill's quote said to never ever give in except to convictions of honor and good sense. Now unfortunately, as a young lawyer, I never got past the never give in part. And a close examination of Lincoln's quote says, persuade your neighbors to compromise whenever you can. I would suggest to you that the real lesson here to be learned is to figure out what your core principles are and never compromise those. But in all other things, look for daylight. So what are your core principles and what should they be? Former United States Senator Alan Simpson, I thought, summarized it best. He said, quote, if you have integrity, nothing else matters. If you don't have integrity, nothing else matters. As you strive to find and identify your core principles, my best advice is to pick up a copy of a book that I've used more than once. It's a book that I've actually used in trial. It's entitled, All I Really Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten by Robert Fulgram. Its premise is that true wisdom is learned not in undergraduate school or law school, but in the sandbox. I used this book once in a well-known trial in Los Angeles. The trial featured the United States and the state of California pitted against four DDT chemical manufacturers. There were 20 tons of DDT offshore in the Pacific Ocean on the Palos Verdes Shelf, which had been deposited there decades ago. The waste was allegedly causing adverse effects on the environmental conditions of the Palos Verdes Shelf and was harming local pelican, eagle, and falcon populations. I represented the state of California. The DDT manufacturers were represented by some of the best lawyers in the world and some of them my friends. After lengthy opening statements by the DDT defendants that featured PowerPoints and laser pointers and graphics beyond belief, all of which directed responsibility for the pollution elsewhere, it was my opportunity to open. I went to the lectern and said, I'm Lane Phillips. I represent the state of California. I don't have any PowerPoints. I don't have any laser pointers. I don't have any graphics or demonstratives. I just brought me with me one exhibit. It's a book entitled, Everything You Need to Know You Learned in Kindergarten. This book and the rules in this book govern the outcome of this case. I then turned to page one of the book and quoted from the kindergarten credo. Rule number one, play fair. Rule number two, say you're sorry when you hurt someone. And rule number three, which I said govern the outcome in the case, was clean up your own mess. I said there's 20 tons of DDT on the Palos Verdes shelf. The United States didn't put it there. The state didn't put it there. The defendants put it there and they have to clean it up. I sat down. The case concluded shortly thereafter in our favor in a monument to the proposition that less is more and that keeping it simple is often the way to go in trials and other journeys in life. Some of the other pearls in this book include share everything, put things back where you found them, wonder, accept responsibility for everything you do, and when you go out in the world, hold hands and stick together. So if you have some spare time, read the book. There are core principles in there for everyone. Lesson number three, and the final lesson, is listening. I used to live in the world of advocacy or talking. Now I live in the world of listening. As a law student and a young lawyer, we're taught to hone and polish our skills of oral advocacy. 
point, counterpoint, rebuttal, sir rebuttal. I actually got pretty good at this. Some of my closing arguments were excerpted in judicial opinions, and I was asked to teach courses on trial advocacy. I could connect with juries, and I could connect with judges. In my later years as a lawyer, however, I learned that listening is every bit as important of a quality as talking. In truth, it's often more important. If you're going to be well regarded as a judge or any type of neutral, you have to make sure that people understand that you've heard them. By that I mean, even if you disagree with them, they must recognize that you've listened to every legal, factual, and equitable point that they've raised before you offer any evaluation or render any judgment. If I could say anything to young lawyers, it would be to try to make the transition to being a better listener earlier than I did. It's amazing what you can hear if you become a better listener. So the next time you get all wound up, you're talking up a storm, you're orally beaming your brilliance all around the room, along with your charm, so much so that you can hardly believe it, step back and listen to yourself. Maybe the next time you won't talk quite as much, you won't talk as loudly, or perhaps even as foolishly. I wish I had practiced the art of great listening earlier in my career. In conclusion, as you take the next steps towards your future goals, I urge you to take notice of these three lessons that I learned. <clears throat> don't impose limits on yourself. Learn when to stand your ground and when to compromise. And don't overlook the rewards of becoming a better listener. As the MasterCard commercial says, these rewards are priceless. While these three things alone will not guarantee you a successful career, used together and in combination with your talent and knowledge that you've acquired here at TU, you'll not only be well armed to handle these challenges and obstacles in life journey, you'll triumph over them. In conclusion, I just want to say that I miss this place, this town, this university. It's very special to me. I'm proud of my law school. I want you to not only be proud of your school, but also thankful to those who sacrificed to make this day possible for you. <coughs> my educational links to Tulsa are many junior high school, high school, undergraduate school, and law school. I also met my wife here in Tulsa, who happens to be a TU law grad, and believe me, many of these things wouldn't have happened or been as much fun without her. She also has taught me more about compromise and dispute resolution than anyone or any other experience that I've had, and in this particular court, I promise you there's no appeal. <laughs> but if there's any feeling of sadness or loss or separation from TU, as a result of your graduation, I assure you it won't last long because the alumni and fundraising organizations will be with you for a long time. <clears throat> it's been my privilege to be with you today on this momentous occasion. Congratulations. Every year, the College of Law faculty awards two distinguished student awards. The first award is the Martin Fellow Smith Award. It is awarded to a graduating student designated by the faculty to, uh, for, uh, as the most outstanding student in the College of Law. Uh, this year's recipient is Stacy Shaw. She'll come forward. The second award is the Judge W. Lee Johnson Award, awarded to the graduating student with the highest cumulative GPA. This year's award is awarded to Margot Shipley. <laughs> Don't get too comfortable, Margot. <laughs> Margot Shipley is also our class valedictorian. And among her many honors during her time at TU College of Law, she was notes and comments editor of Tulsa Law Review. She was a Tulsa Lawyers for Children trainee. She was a Kendall Court participant. She received the highest grades in torts, criminal law, constitutional law, property law, immigration law, 
decedents, estates, and trusts, family law, and just about everything else. <laughs> she was third place in the 1L negotiation competition and fourth place in the Hager Towards Appellant competition. And she's also the recipient of the OBA Outstanding Student Award in Family Law. And she's received the highest award the law school can bestow, uh, which is our Order of Kuril Chair. At this time, I'd like to present your class valedictorian, Margot Shipley. Thank you, Dean Cordell. Nearly three years ago, the class of 2014 gathered at John Rogers Hall for our first day of school. We were excited. We were nervous. We were eager to begin a new chapter in our lives. As I walked the halls on that first day, I hoped that no one would be able to figure out what I was thinking, that in the back of my mind, I had felt like I had no idea what I was doing. I wasn't sure how I'd be able to get through the next few years. I was scared about law school exams, nervous about being called on in class, terrified at the thought of speaking in front of large groups. My classmates know all too well that my face tends to turn a lovely shade of bright red when I get nervous. In short, I secretly feared that I did not have what it took to make it through three long and challenging years of law school. Despite all of these concerns, I made the decision to continue to pursue my goal of being a law student. I decided I could forgive myself for failing, but I could not forgive myself for not even trying. I decided to show up, take it one day at a time, and give it all that I had. I have come to realize, though, that I am not the only one who has felt the fear of failure. In fact, I think that all of us, whether in law school or at another point in our lives, have been afraid of failing. We have asked ourselves, what am I doing here? Do I really have what it takes to succeed? We have all been faced with a choice. Will we live easy, safe lives within our comfort zone? Or will we challenge ourselves and dare to pursue our dreams and goals, even when they seem unattainable? We are gathered here today to celebrate the fact that this group of students has overcome the obstacles placed in our paths, conquered our fears of failure, and accomplished what we set out to achieve. We all showed up one day at a time for three years and in a few minutes, we will walk across the stage and earn the degrees for which we have worked so hard. In order to obtain these diplomas, we've learned a lot about contracts and torts, criminal law and constitutional law, how to construct an argument, how to write a brief or a memo. But these lessons, while undoubtedly valuable, are to me less important than what we have learned outside of the classroom. We have learned firsthand the benefits and rewards of persistence diligence, and determination. We have learned that it is possible to survive just about anything with the help of supportive friends and family members. We have learned that at the end of the day, success and happiness are measured not by our accomplishments, degrees, the amount of money in the bank, but by character, integrity, and our relationships with others. Finally, we have learned that if we conquer our fears instead of letting them define us, we can achieve things that we thought were not possible. On behalf of my classmates, I would like to thank our families, our friends, and the faculty of John Rogers Hall who have helped us make it to this day. We could not have done it without you. To the class of 2014, I would like to say thank you for being my classmates and my friends for the past three years. I will miss you. Congratulations and enjoy this happy day. Now for the hooding of the graduates. Uh, we will start with the LLM graduates, then the JD graduates, and then the MJ graduates. Um, Martha Cordell, Dean Cordell will read your names and will be insisted by Dean Bridges in the hooding. Um, the first uh, degree recipients uh, are LLM students, uh, LLM in American Law for Foreign Lawyers. If you'd please rise and approach the stage. Mm -hmm. 
I apologize. I'm going to have to have him pronounce his name. Onyenichi Anyao. Ozu Neeson. Constant Chemo. Sandra Sharp. Our next degree program is the LLM in American Indian and Indigenous Law. Recipient here is Robert John Dunn III. We will now hood the JD uh, candidates. If you, uh, the first row, would please rise. Stacy Shaw. Kylie Nicole Wright. Lauren Elizabeth McCreary. Emily Krukowski. Marianella is Marianella is also one of our LLM graduates as well. Carol Beatty. Diane Hernandez. Ephraim Alajaji. <laughs> Lucas Downing. <laughs> D. Daniel Delizia. Daniel Levy. Chris Flail. Lauren Kabuchi.
Jesse O'Dell. Megan Evans. Sarah Friedenrich. <laughs> Micah Peterson. <laughs> William Sylvia. Samuel Perrine. <laughs> Eric Wiborg. <laughs> Jill Jamaladeen. China Smith. Kimberly Wendell. Abra Drybread. Lene Clatt. <laughs> Heather Kinsall. <laughs> Sarah Harp. Danielle Davis. <laughs> Alan Neil Barker. I'd like to point out a correction in the hooding program. Alan is actually graduating with highest honors. Congratulations, Alan. Jessica Gleberman. <laughs> Ryan Kuzmik. Jonathan Patrick Nation. Jeffrey Sean Waters. <laughs> Melissa Moore. S. Arnold. <laughs> Mitchell 
Matthew Como. Brian Kershaw. Kyle Long. Deborah Scroggins. Spencer Roebuck. Brian Melton. Troy James McPherson. Clay Zelps. <laughs> Catherine Armstrong. <laughs> Daniel Wilson. David Mann. Eric Angel. Matthew Mims. Clinton Alfred Wilson. Nathan Bills. Kurt Baumgartner. Brian Bohan. <laughs> Laurel Carbone. <laughs> Riley. Kern. Sierra Freeman. Joshua Daniel Poovey. <laughs> Anthony Leolius.
Nathan Bloomer. Casey Cook. <laughs> Mike Gia Ramita Jr. <laughs> Leslie Diana. Taylor Smith. <laughs> Travis Sterling Smith. Nicole Johnson. <laughs> Devon Ashley Dutton. Ashley Heather Salisbury. Be careful. Rachel Farrar. Lorenzo G. Barcina. Danielle Wingfield. <laughs> Rachel Marie Manus Dallas. Brandon Tyler. Caleb McKee. Adrian Rents. Brian Laver. Wong. Tanya Means. Aaron Don Brock. Ashley Noel Clink. Andrea Smith.
Our next degree candidates will receive a Master of Jurisprudence in Indian Law. Yadira Caballero. Christine Holden. I mean, it is Oklahoma, right? Christine Renee Mosier. Billy Barlow. And last but not least, Margot Shipley. And let's give the class of 2014 a round of applause. And it is now time to move your tassels from the right to the left. Congratulations, graduates. Before we conclude, you, can, you may be seated. Before I ask Chaplain Francis to come up and deliver the benediction, I'd like to invite all family and friends into John Rogers Hall and graduates for a reception. And we also have arranged for Irwin Photography to take any photos that your families or graduates may want in the moot courtroom. Thank you. Now Chaplain Francis. Thank you, Dean Levitt. And um, after hearing the words of your valedictorian, Margot, and uh, the words of Honorable Lane Phillips. The reminder was of the, uh, the really the parsimony of our uh, life together, the uh, understanding of char character and integrity. And uh, Lane Phillips bringing us the words of Robert Fulgen, although I did lean over and say my favorite word from that book is take a nap which is, is about time, so remember that word, as well as have a heart, a heart guided by playing fair, saying you're sorry, and cleaning up your mess. Go forth in the peace of our Lord, the Redeemer, the Creator, the Sustainer of life together. Amen. <laughs>